Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here at IBM Think 2025 in Boston. I'm inside the Think Forum I'm with Brendan Kincaid, uh, VP of Strategic Partnerships for IBM. Uh, Brendan, uh, welcome to the show. You've not been on before, but it's great to have you. Uh, and just uh, for maybe those who aren't maybe familiar with what that job is, uh, uh, talk about what that job entails. Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being here at IBM Think 2025. It's been a terrific event so far, and I'm looking forward to, to all that's coming after today. So. I lead our strategic technology partnerships. So in that role, I have responsibility for working, let's say, um, mutually beneficial, mutually profitable relationships with a set of global technology partners. So that, those include uh, silicon chip vendors, infrastructure partners, some software players, and uh, those partnerships are really essential to helping IBM land our key imperatives around hybrid cloud and AI. And, and how many partners would that be? Well, I, there, we, we do have some stratification there. There are really eight partners at what we call our top strategic tier. And those are typically partners with whom we're doing about $100 million or okay. more in aggregate business. So these are the big of the big. That's right. Yeah. Now, um, it, you know, watching IBM go through these different technology shifts, I mean, IBM has been around a long time. Uh, when we're at these moments, these transitional periods going from uh, a lot of uh, multi-tenant cloud to hybrid cloud, obviously AI is on everyone's roadmap. Um, uh, how, how much more important are these partnerships in helping customers bring their solutions uh, to, to, to deployment? I, I think they're absolutely yeah. essential, yeah. right? If I'm going to run AI on premises or in a hybrid environment, I really need to have the infrastructure. I need to have the right stack to support that, whether it's the GPUs, whether it's the servers, whether it's the networking, the security around that. It's really important that I can quickly access that through my procurement or supply chain if I'm an enterprise. I need, and if we have prescriptive solutions built out with a set of technology partners, let's call them a, a validated design. Right. That's yeah. inclusive of <clears throat> Red Hat OpenShift, Watson X, for example. Then I can deliver it more quickly in a, a prescriptive architecture so that I can get uh, realized value more quickly. You know, it's, it's interesting that uh, throughout the years watching technology ebb and flow where, um, uh, you know, it seems once the technology matures, then everybody wants everything open and disaggregated. And then when these technology waves come, customers can't put the solutions together themselves and then validated designs become back in vogue. And it certainly appears when you look at a lot of the companies participating, particularly in the AI and private cloud space, validated designs have really become the only way to go to market. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's essential. Yeah. in this space in particular, when you're trying to recognize time to value. Yeah, well customers right? just don't have the skills in, in a lot of cases. Exactly, like, yeah. and, yeah. and many clients are moving past that experimentation phase into actual production, yeah. and in order to do that, they need, it, particularly if they're running in a regulated industry, it's important that they have a, you know, a validated architecture that can run close to where their, their actual client data resides which is typically on premises or in a private data center. So yes, we have cloud partners. Yes, we have our own cloud. And those are great options for people who want to run AI workloads. And it depends on the sensitivity of their data and their desire to have kind of control or sovereignty around what they're doing with AI. Yeah. Now, um, I, I did notice that at the show, you had a blog go out about uh, expanding the partnership with AMD. Yes. And so could you uh, drill down at that, please? Yeah. So yes, uh, today we actually um, are putting out communications around the general availability of AMD MI300X GPUs in IBM Cloud. So we already have announced a, a partnership with Intel around Gaudi 3s, and of course we work very closely with yeah. NVIDIA use H100s, H200s. I think in our research cluster, in fact, we're one of the first to get the, the GB200s up and running in yeah. production. Yeah, okay, well that's good. And what that does is it gives customers choice, 
right? It, so, it, yeah. it gives them choice and it gives them options around some, some of the, you know, some of the GPUs have more memory than others. Yeah. Some of them are more uh, power efficient and it gives them optionality, but it also gives them the ability to it, it really improve the cost of inferencing. And that's key. So what is the, uh, let's call it the price performance across a million tokens, right? What's my price for per million tokens? And that can really help drive me to get lower cost inferencing and, and better results. And what would the sweet spot of this relationship be? Is it, is it around inferencing? The AMD? I, I, I think it, the, the, we're focused on inferencing. We do think that that's where the industry is going, not only inferencing, but on running smaller, more purpose-built models. Okay, and I know um, Qualcomm's a relatively new partnership, right? For IBM. Yes, yeah. it is. And uh, if you could expand on that, I know uh, Granite 3.1 now runs on the uh, on, on their uh, AI hub, right? That's which, right. Which brings AI to the edge, and so maybe talk about that trend, and are you seeing more AI at the edge, or demand for it? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> we think that that's a huge uh, opportunity. I th if you look at where Qualcomm plays, right, in mobile devices, in vehicles, and autom uh, automotive, there's a huge, I would say, uh, a, an opportunity there to take really enterprise class AI out to the edge. Some of the things that we've announced together with them are, say, running Watson X and Maximo AI on the Qualcomm. Um, it's their AI inferencing appliance that was introduced at CES. Yeah. And also, um, most recently at MWC, we demonstrated AI safety at the edge. So running granite models with IBM Watson X dot governance on a mobile device. So that will prevent a mobile user from being able to, let's say, uh, keep some guardrails and safety around what they're doing as they're uh, prompting the model. Yeah. And so uh, that's interesting that was a mobile congress. I remember the announcement. It seems like a lifetime ago, but I guess in the AI world, a couple of months is a lifetime ago. It was, yeah, it was just a couple of months yeah, ago, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, but that, yeah. but that does seem like a long time ago. Now, uh, what about some other areas uh, of, of partnership? I know Quantum uh, was a topic in Arvind's keynote this morning at uh, uh, during Think, um, and I find that kind of a fascinating topic because nobody seems to know the when or the what. Arvind seemed, I'm not going to say super bullish, but say moderately bu bullish. Uh, yes. Maybe five years, where other there's other pessimists that are thinking more. You know, uh, uh, at least a decade out. So I'm just curious, from an IBM perspective, what's driving Quantum, and then maybe some partnerships in that area. Well, I, I think Arvin mentioned that we have over 200 partners around yeah. Quantum today. So whether they're uh, universities and research groups, whether they're, uh, let's say, country-specific consortiums, there's a they're certainly starting to move quickly in Quantum. I think it really represents. It's a, a significant leap forward in what we're able to do. Arvin also mentioned some of the things that, some of the problems that they're trying to solve. Like, what are some of the yeah. challenges around, I think you mentioned brain cancer and trying yeah. to understand Well, life sciences things. and healthcare life seem sciences. to be one of the big low-hanging fruit use cases, right? right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, what's going to be interesting about that is, um, uh, you know, at Quantum Day at the GTC, um, I, one of the uh, speakers brought up, it's not about you know, even GPU computing kind of added to traditional computing, yeah. right? But quantum actually has the opportunity to transform computing and start solving problems we couldn't solve before exactly. versus doing problems that we can do today faster. And that yeah. takes me to something I heard yesterday in a session, and that was the concept of machine scale. And I questioned the speaker about that to say, well, what, what exactly you're talking about with machine scale? And it's really, we talk about how the humans were first in the AI chain, and now they're on the AI chain. In the edge. And okay. as we start to build the infrastructure to support the next generation of agents, for example, let's say, I think Arvin mentioned today, a, a billion agents yes. being created, right? So how do we have to build out the infrastructure to support that when it's actually machines that are starting to build these agents? Together with humans. Agents building agents. Agents building I, agents. I think I saw a movie about that. Didn't yeah. turn out too well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, I did, on a serious note, I did want to ask you about that concept where uh, I think um, uh, this morning, this keynote, Arvind mentioned 150 uh, 
new uh, agentic agents available and connectors to different applications. And I do think here's where partnerships can really add value because when I think about um, what a, an agentic agent is, right, it's the ability for an agent to make a decision yes. and execute a process. Now, most processes in enterprises use more than one application, which means almost by definition, agents are gonna have to access multiple applications. Correct. And so if these things are built in silos, I, I, I can just, I, I picture a world where, you know, I look at the world of chat today, where one chat tool doesn't talk to another, and it creates a lot of manual integration for the user. With agents, I don't think we can do that. Like, I, I just can't imagine 50 applications, 50 agents, and me being the user, having to stitch that data together, right? And so, it seems to me that the work you're doing on the partnership side really is an important element of making sure the agents can work together. Absolutely, yeah. and I think there was an announcement um, around what we're doing with uh, agentic orchestration, or the yes, orchestration yeah across agents so that they actually do have a way to talk together. So that is, I think, a, a promising new development and one that I'm excited to see. I'm sure there'll be more news coming about that, but to me, that's that's a powerful one, yeah, rather well, than having a bunch well, of- Well, I'm glad you're getting out in front of that because there's one thing the tech industry has been really poor about. It's it's driving interoperability during the kind of initial wave of technology. Usually we get the stuff out and then we figure out, oh, none of this stuff talks to each other. Let's right. store it on the user until we figure it out, right? right. Yeah. yeah, so. I think it goes back to that concept of that machine scale, right? Yeah. How is this all interconnected in a way that it can scale to, to basically size and capacities that we haven't really contemplated? Yeah. All right, Brendan, so uh, we talked about AMD, Qualcomm, any other, uh, anything else you wanna, can you share with us? Uh, maybe looking forward a little bit? Without getting yourself in any safe harbor troubles? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think you're, you should expect more from us around yeah. the go-to-market with these technology partnerships. I think you'll see more and more integrations between our technologies. I think some of the announcements today, in fact, feature that other companies, whether it's Oracle or SAP, Well, it was great using... to see Kate Johnson even from Lumen on stage. Yeah. Because I've always felt that, uh, I'm a former network engineer, and always okay. felt that the network never really gets its place among the hierarchy of technology vendors. But I think in, the, in an AI world, especially some of the stuff we talked about with Edge coming, the network's gonna have to play a really important part in it. And so it's good to see even at that level of a network builder partnering with IBM to make sure that the, the you know the, really that underlying network fabric is there to allow AI to, to, to really flourish. So I yeah. definitely think we're gonna see yeah. more AI at the edge. Yeah. I think that that's gonna be, just become prevalent. Yeah. We'll see it in more on mobile devices, we'll see it on PCs, we'll see it in manufacturing and industrial, we'll see it in automotive. Uh, I think that we're just beginning to scratch the surface with that. So to me, that's a big opportunity, All right. as well as extending governance across that, because... That, yeah, that's, that's a really important point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right, more AI coming, which means more governance, a lot more headaches for the IT pro, but IBM is developing partnerships to reduce a lot of that complexity. They got Absolutely. that right? Absolutely, you did. Okay. Thanks so much. Anything else you want to add? No, All right. terrific. So I'm back with Brendan Kincaid from IBM. I'm CS Caravalo from CK Research, and thanks for watching. Uh, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time. I'm in the next episode of Zcast. Thanks, Brendan.